For those who are able to listen, this is a story worth hearing. The first time that my uncle raped me, I was six. By the way, my father was not in the picture at any of this. Uh, the reason why all this abuse was able to happen was because my parents were getting separated. And my uncle told me that because my father was living with his parents, that meant that he didn't love me and my little sister anymore and he wouldn't believe us. Um, I was only able to come forward to my mom because he raped my little sister and made me watch. <laughs> he made me watch. I thought that my mom would be mad at me because I couldn't protect her. She wasn't mad at me, though. Uh, she uh, immediately started the whole process of trying to get him held accountable. This whole time, she's been the one to protect us when nobody else would. Uh, and she was just a child herself. I mean, what 20-year-old knows what to do when that happens, you know? The family wanted to protect him and not me. And they were really big in the church. Um, a few years later, I was a, I had realized that I was not mature enough for college. So I left the college that I was attending and joined the Marine Corps. I was stationed in California and I found out that he had been arrested in Idaho for raping his daughter. So I feel a lot of guilt because I didn't try hard enough. I didn't try hard enough to warn her, and it's my fault that he did this again. I wanted to kill him. Uh, Idaho is not that far from California, and one of my friends knew that I was upset about something and got me to tell him why I was upset. and. Uh, he was like, well, let's go. He's like, let's do this. And we had a plan, and I realized, though, that uh, my uncle had stolen my childhood. I was not going to give him control over my adulthood. When the Me Too Marv movement started in the fall, I wanted to share my story, uh, but all I was able to do was just share hashtag Me Too. And that's the whole truth. The story came to us for our ongoing feature, The Whole Truth. Now, uh, the idea of The Whole Truth, as it was originally conceived, was to serve as an outlet for untold and hard to tell stories. But I think this one demands further elaboration and discussion. We do need to talk with someone who can take us through what we've just heard and talk about uh, the rawness of this experience at the very least. Emily LeBlanc is a licensed professional counselor supervisor, LPCS. She is a community advocate for survivors of abuse in the Austin, Texas area. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes out to talk with us on the Texas Standard. It's my pleasure. The first thing this woman says, her mother believed her story. How can grown-ups recognize when children speaking about sexual uh, abuse uh, are in fact sharing something that demands your attention when maybe those kids don't even have the language to express themselves? Well, I, th I think you touched on the most important one, and that's when someone tells you they've been sexually assaulted or sexually abused, you start by believing them, which is what her mother did. Um, I think as far as what we can do for kids who may not have the words yet, because right. that's also very common. We can look for um, changes, particularly sudden changes in their behavior and their sleeping habits and their eating habits if they were social and now they isolate or vice versa, or anything that seems developmentally out of place if they regress um, to an earlier stage of development, they're acting younger than they are or older than they are, talking about things that don't seem developmentally appropriate. Those are all signs that we can look for that a child's trying to tell us something. So um, let's assume you are a grown-up in that position. What do you do? What is the next step? 
The very first step is to believe that child and to acknowledge what you've heard. I hear what you're telling me um, and validate that they are not alone, that you are going to stay with them. You're going to get them help um, and that you believe what they're telling you. In this uh, um, particular segment of The Whole Truth, we uh, heard the woman uh, here say that her family was big in the church. Um, we're not going to mention what church because this goes to the issue of anonymity, but people of faith everywhere, I think, have been shaken by allegations of sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, that's, uh, that, that's not singular in that regard uh, by any means. But there's so much pressure on survivors from not wanting to seem disrespectful to their faith uh, to not wanting to accuse people who cast themselves as servants of God. Um, what are your thoughts on that? First of all, there's nothing godly about sexual assault or sexual abuse. Right. Uh, so I want to start there. Um, the second thing to know is that there's three ingredients that are needed in order for sexual abuse to occur, and those are access, privacy, and control. Access, privacy, and control. Correct. And all three are often found in religious institutions, which makes them particularly vulnerable for perpetrators. Um, access, certainly because there's children um, included in almost all communities of faith. Privacy, because religion and faith is such a personal experience, it's, it's built into the institutions. And control, because there's nothing more powerful than being seen as the authority on what's sacred. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy for perpetrators within church communities to get access, privacy, and control to their victims. Yeah. I think the other thing to consider is that perpetrators almost always engage in what's called community grooming. How do you mean community grooming? So they're not just grooming their victims um, by telling them it's their fault and trying to instill um, shame in their victims. They're grooming the whole community. So they're establishing themselves as you know the guy that we would never believe would do that, mm -hmm. and which is why it's so common to hear, you know, about coaches or teachers or priests or pastors, because the community believes that that person would never do something to harm their children, because most people in those positions would never do something to harm their children, and that makes it less likely that their victims are going to disclose what happened to them because they too believe that the community won't believe them. We've been talking about shame here, but I want to focus on something else that is uh, incredibly heart-wrenching, and that's where this woman says, uh, well, she expresses feelings of guilt. Um, how common is that, and what does the community do about it? I would say that guilt is almost universal um, to survivors of sexual assault and sexual abuse. I've, I've worked with thousands of survivors, and almost every single one of them has struggled with feelings of guilt about could, what happened Could you to them. elaborate on that? Because it's hard, especially if you see someone who is a survivor, to see how... I mean, from a distance, how they are responsible, and yet that person has internalized this feeling of guilt? Where does that come from? It comes from the abuser. The, the perpetrators spend a lot of time and energy trying to convince the victims that it's their fault because it's how they isolate them. So I think it's extremely common. As far as what we as the community can, can do about that, I think um, the first thing we have to do is start by believing victims and be protective of victims. It's it's the only crime that gets committed where we question victims. Mm -hmm. If I'm, you know, robbed walking out of the grocery store, no one asks me why I had my purse on my shoulder or why I was carrying groceries in my hands or, you know, why I had my wallet with me or what credit cards I had on me or what I was wearing. But for some reason, with sexual assault and sexual abuse, um, presumably because the body is the crime scene, we start to question victims about what they were doing. And I think there's a protective factor in that for the community. Um, in Texas, a third of women are sexual assault survivors. and A third of women? A third of women, according to the most recent prevalence study, um, are survivors of sexual assault in the state of Texas. And it, it's a pretty scary world to walk around thinking that I'm at that high of a risk of being hurt. So I think it's, it's somewhat natural to start to look for reasons it won't happen to me. And if I can blame victims um, for what they were wearing or what they were drinking or who they were talking to or who they were dating, I can get a false sense of reality and a false sense of control that maybe I can keep it from happening to me. But as is evident in this story, um, in order to really take that control, we would have to say, I'm not going to church, I'm not getting married, I'm not dating, I'm not going to have male friends. Most women are assaulted by uh, men who they know 
and children almost always are assaulted by someone that they trust. And so I think as a community, we have to shift our perception to what reality really is, which is that there's a high risk for sexual assault and sexual abuse. And there's no evidence that victims lie about sexual assault or sexual abuse at any higher rate than any other violent crime. And so we have to start by believing victims when they tell us what happened to them. Uh, I have to ask you about uh, how or whether you've seen any change or difference uh, from the power of the hashtag, of course, uh, Me Too. Uh, what, have you, what have you seen on the ground as a professional? I've seen survivors feeling empowered um, to tell their stories and to take control of their own healing and to not rely on a broken system to find justice or healing for them. Uh, I think it's a fantastic way for survivors to use their voices and to find each other because we heal in community. And if I can see that I'm not alone, I'm more likely to be able to heal from that trauma. Uh, but the other thing I would say about the Me Too movement is that you don't owe anyone your story. And so... I'm sorry, say that one more time. Survivors don't owe anyone their stories. So I know lots of survivors who feel compelled to participate in the Me Too movement, but but don't want to or aren't ready. And I don't want that to generate guilt for those survivors. Mm -hmm. We do whatever we have to do to survive. Our brains and our bodies are programmed to keep us alive and to help us survive. And every survivor has to do what's right for her and her healing. And that may not be disclosing the abuse for everyone. I suppose we should point out too, um, it's not always just a her. Correct. In Texas, I think it's one in seven men is a survivor of sexual abuse or sexual assault. And um, it's far more common for certainly child survivors to be male um, as well. So, yeah. yes. Um, so how does someone listening to this conversation, how do they take it to the next step? Can they take it to the next step? What resources might exist for someone who feels a need to act on what they've been hearing here? Well, there's resources in, in most communities, certainly traditional resources like rape crisis centers, counseling centers, uh, YWCAs, advocacy groups um, that can help get professional services to victims when they need them. Um, there's also, especially with the Me Too movement, um, an uprising of grassroots efforts, survivors coming together and finding new ways to use social media, new ways um, to meet new ways to um, identify other survivors and advocate for each other. And so I think, you know, something we all as a community can do is be supportive of those efforts. And again, start by believing victims when they tell us. Um, and when we see people engaging in victim blaming or start to question a survivor's behavior, um, we can call it out when we see it and say that that's not okay with us. We've been speaking with Emily LeBlanc. She's a licensed professional counselor supervisor, LPC 